afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. From the Fairmont Royal York in downtown Toronto, welcome once again to the 113th season of the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or podcast or live on Rogers TV, welcome to the meeting. Now before our distinguished speaker is introduced today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our head table. And for those of you who have been to an Empire Club lunch this season, uh, we allow people to clap as people are announced. So please provide your support as you see fit. So first, I'd like to announce uh, Mayor John Tory, Mayor of the City of Toronto. And also, Mayor Tory was actually a past director at the Empire Club, so it's a privilege to have him back with us. Next, we have Ms. Jan De Silva, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Toronto Region Board of Trade. <laughs> Councillor Gary Crawford, Budget Chief, City of Toronto. <laughs> Mr. Colin Lynch, Senior Vice President of Strategy and Growth at Greystone Managed Investments and the First Vice President of the Empire Club of Canada. Next up, we have Ms. Amanda Galbraith, Principal at Navigator Limited. <laughs> Mr. Tim Smithman, Manager of Government Affairs at Union Gas and the second Vice President of the Empire Club of Canada. <laughs> Mr. Michael Walsh, Senior Vice President, Connor Clark and Lund Financial Group. Councillor Anna Bailao, City Councillor Ward 18, Davenport. And once again, my name is Paul Fogelin. My day job, I'm the Vice President of the Ontario Retirement Communities Association and your President for the Empire Club this season. Ladies and gentlemen, your head table guests. I would also like to acknowledge that we have three past presidents of the club with us today. I welcome to the lunch Mr. Noble Chumar, Ms. Verity Sylvester, and Mr. David Edmondson. Please give them a round of applause. So on January 10th of 1974, then Mayor David Crombie delivered an address here at the Empire Club of Canada. He covered some familiar topics, transit, affordable housing, supports for the elderly, but he also spoke about the inability of cities to raise the revenues necessary to meet the needs of a growing and diverse population. And I quote, we are still in the position where we do not have the money to deliver the services we logically can perform better than the central government. We still labor along with regressive property tax base as our main source of revenue to supply an ever widening range of services. He continues, I predict in 1974, you will hear from the mayors of cities across this great country on the problem of money and power as it relates to the provincial and federal governments." End quote. So while it may be discouraging that some of these challenges have not disappeared with the passage of time, take comfort, Mayor Tory, in knowing that other mayors have dealt with these issues. And more importantly, from any point of view, the City of Toronto has made tremendous positive progress in the many years since Mayor Crombie's address. Toronto is Canada's largest city. It's the fourth largest city in North America and home to a diverse and talented population. It's a global centre for business, finance, arts and culture, and is consistently ranked as one of the world's most livable cities. A world-class city demands world-class leadership. Someone with effective management skills, political savvy, the will to make tough decisions, and the ability to attract business, jobs, and tourists. In order to successfully navigate the growth of a global metropolis, you require a skilled navigator. And in that regard, Torontonians are fortunate to have John Tory at the helm. Born and raised in Toronto, Mayor Tory has spent his career, career promoting and giving back to the city he loves. As a lawyer, talk show host, businessman, member of provincial parliament, leader of the official opposition at Queen's Park, and finally as mayor, he has long believed that diversity is the strength of the city. As mayor, his focus is on bringing the city together as one Toronto. Mertori is a lifelong and self-proclaimed long-suffering Toronto Maple Leafs fan, maybe not for long, hopefully. 
and Meritori and his wife Barbara have been married since 1978. They raised their four children, John Jr., Chris, Susan, and George, here in the city of Toronto, and are delighted now to have five grandchildren to spoil. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in providing a very generous welcome to our guest of honour, the 65th Mayor of Toronto, John Tory. Well, President uh, Paul and uh, distinguished guests, one and all, uh, first of all, happy Valentine's Day and uh, welcome uh, to the Empire Club. I, I, I'm sure there's no place you'd rather be uh, on Valentine's Day than here, uh, hearing me talk about the city's finances. Uh, maybe if we dimmed the lights a little bit, uh, there'd be a slightly uh, better mood in the room. It, it reminded me of one year, probably about six or seven years ago, when I was a broadcaster, and uh, as is the case today, Barb, my wife, uh, was away for Valentine's Day. And so I had this idea uh, that I would um, sort of found this Lonely Hearts Club uh, up, up from among my listeners and that I invited uh, women uh, to call uh, who had nothing to do or who wanted to have dinner and I said I would host a dinner for 15 uh, women uh, on Valentine's Day just because they were otherwise uh, going to be alone as was I. And there was a tremendous response uh, from people. <laughs> But they had to say why they wanted to come to dinner with me, and I was astounded uh, to find that of the 15 women, uh, like about half of them said that they were uh, going to come to dinner with me because their husbands refused to recognize the existence of Valentine's Day. <laughs> And I was astounded, thinking, who are these guys? And, and you know, I, but, but in any event, uh, we had the dinner. Uh, I haven't been allowed to have one of those since. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and I suspect if I did it as mayor, there'd be some, uh, some tongues would wag over that, so I'm just not doing that. But uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here. May I acknowledge uh, that uh, I am here as one of a council that has responsibility for the affairs of the city, and I want to just welcome uh, some of my colleagues who were here. Two of them uh, were introduced, Gary Crawford and Anna Bailau, but also Councillor Mary Margaret McMahon, Councillor John Campbell, Councillor Kristen Carmichael Greb, and Councillor Paul Ainsley uh, are also here, and I would welcome them. I will just single one of them out for attention given the topic of uh, my remarks today, which is to do uh, with the finances and the budget, and that's uh, Gary Crawford. Um, of all the thankless tasks you can get, um, in the city government, to be the budget chief is the most thankless of all because it is uh, a tremendously complex and time-consuming job. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you can't, like, like a lot of aspects of being in public life, you can't satisfy everybody, um, or seemingly sometimes you can't satisfy anybody. Uh, but uh, he's been working on this all year. And, um, you know, while I'm one of his biggest supporters and sort of, I guess, ending up as the lead spokesperson for what we're all doing, um, a lot of the work has been done by him. And, Gary, I, I appreciate that as I'm sure do the people of Toronto uh, very, very much. So tomorrow uh, we begin the City Council debate at the end of a very long process that did start many months ago uh, of the 2017 budget. And as I mentioned, our, councilor, our, our City Council has 44 councillors plus myself and uh, together we represent uh, Toronto's more than 2.7 million residents. And as you know, we're a city of many uh, neighbourhoods. Uh, we are home to people from around the world, from all walks of life, all different occupations uh, and have uh, many different uh, points of view. And so when it comes uh, to the annual budget, you, you, you hear, if you're a consumer of the news, uh, many of the louder voices who will say we're either spending too little or we're spending too much. Uh, but you don't tend to hear uh, from uh, perhaps other than your neighbours or people you socialize with uh, from a lot of average people. I think my job as the mayor uh, and Gary's job as the budget chief and all of our jobs really as city councillors is to listen to all of the voices, to try to break through the rhetoric, to look closely at the numbers and to lead a budget process that satisfies the needs of our citizens as best we can while demonstrating that, that, that at the same time we're a government that acts responsibly and spends money wisely. Uh, this year, the operating budget of the city will be uh, more than $10 billion, uh, from which we must support dozens of city agencies and divisions. You're familiar with the big ones, like the TTC and the police, but there are many others. And we have to uh, su provide support to all the other different activities that we undertake on behalf of the people, ranging from libraries to shelters to roads to garbage collection to water systems. And at the same time, uh, we have a capital budget that is uh, going to be about $2.8 billion this year um, to expand the different systems that the city needs uh, and moving forward as part of 
a 10-year capital plan that is in the neighborhood of $26.5 billion. So I think this uh, would indicate to you that cities are, as you know, complex uh, organizations that have to be constantly recalibrated to make sure that no one group is being left behind and that no one group is shouldering too much of the burden. And I think that the no one group being left behind is um, very much a Toronto value that we all share. I think it's a Canadian uh, value. I believe that is what this budget to be formally presented to the whole Council tomorrow uh, achieves. The budget reflects Toronto's identity as a place where people do care about each other, a place where the public expects us to invest in things like recreation, programming, childcare, public health, and so on, because these are often the measures or the programs that are supporting those most vulnerable uh, in our city that need uh, this kind of support. But the budget also reflects something else that is expected of us, which is real savings and efficiencies, because Toronto is also home to people from all walks of life and all corners of the earth. They share an expectation that we, as the elected leaders and those who help us in our wonderful uh, public service, will look carefully at the books and will look carefully at every line in the books. Even though the line was there last year and the year before and the year before, it's perfectly good reason to look at it and to find new ways of doing things so that tax revenues are deployed with maximum impact and minimum uh, of, uh, of wastage or duplication. So, uh, you know, despite what some people will say, our budget is not an either-or uh, scenario. I believe that we have struck a balance between necessary investment and ongoing restraint, just like most people have to do in their lives and in their businesses with their finances. We have put forward a budget that restrains property tax increases to the rate of inflation, a promise that I will keep uh, to Toronto's homeowners. You heard David Crombie making reference many years ago on this same platform to the regressive nature of property taxes. And beyond being regressive, they impose a particular hardship if the increases are too great on people like senior citizens who are in their homes and who have been in their homes for a long time. And we know from all the studies they're better off in their homes, but they also are often living on a fixed income. And property taxes are one of the biggest checks they write over the course of a year. And the same is true for new uh, homeowners as well. We've also put forward a budget beyond keeping a property tax increase increases to the rate of inflation that does invest in things that our residents need. So the TTC's operating budget this year is new, nearly $2 billion, one-fifth of our overall operating expenditure. Because our residents rely so heavily on the TTC, we're spending $80 million more than last year, the largest increase in many years. And you've heard various words that get thrown about uh, uh, that have to do with cutbacks. And $80 million as an increase is not any kind of a reduction. It is an $80 million increase. It is exactly what it is set out uh, as being. The 2017 budget also invests $185 million to make Toronto more affordable for low-income residents. For example, it adds 300 child care subsidies so that more people can afford to go back to work or to school and make sure at the same time that their children are safe and protected. It protects, and there was some debate about this, and I listened carefully to parents who spoke in that debate and to some of my council colleagues. It protects the occupancy grants for 350 child care centres that provide that child care for thousands of children uh, in provincially operated schools so that the price of child care won't rise for thousands of Toronto parents. Our operating budget at the same time also reflects an impressive array of savings, about $191 million in total. And again, you heard quite a lot of controversy for the fact that I had the audacity to ask all of the agencies and departments of government to identify 2.6% in savings and efficiencies that they could bring about if it was necessary. And it was only to ask them to go through the discipline that I think everybody else in business and in their personal lives goes through all the time, which is if we had to make a sacrifice, what would it be? And you're best to ask that of the departments rather than have it imposed by city councillors or by people in the senior ranks of the public service. And so those lists were brought forward, and many of the things that were on those lists were not accepted. Many of them. But many of them were accepted to a total of $191 million. And we went through this by going through the budget line by line, including all of the biggest budgets, like the police service and the transit authority. And we were asking ourselves a question, is there a better way to do this? And what we have as a result, for the first time in 11 years, and you've seen little notice taken of this, but it is a very significant accomplishment. For the first time in 11 years, maybe the first time ever, the police budget, for example, which comes in at about a billion dollars, is actually going down this year. 
it's not gone down in 11 years, and maybe it's never gone down. We, we just don't have necessarily the ability to calculate on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. And it is going down without affecting community safety uh, or community uh, policing. Across the city divisions, we're getting smarter and leaner and more efficient. We're modernizing the government to, get, to, to take away this, uh, uh, this uh, tendency to do things with clipboards and pens and move to uh, the digital world where the city was actually running behind uh, many organizations uh, outside of government. The size of the government workforce will shrink by more than 400 people this year through attrition. And we're moving to, to reduce, again by attrition, the ranks of management uh, over the next three years by 10 percent. And you know, you know people in this room and lots of other people know because they've been through the experience this can be done by looking at ways to be more productive and to have existing managers uh, be able to accomplish more, sometimes with the help of technology. We are using technology to serve the public more efficiently, making up for literally decades during which the city government did not invest adequately in more efficient, customer-friendly delivery of services. So, for example, the Toronto Public Library, which is the largest public library system in the world, I'm proud to say, uh, which, by the way, will receive an increase in its budget this year, again, contrary to what you might have heard, it's also one of the most innovative agencies that we have. And it's going to save more than a million dollars over the next two years by doing something as simple as letting people pay their fines at self-checkout stations. And people do this because they don't want to have a record of not uh, paying their fines, obviously. The TTC is going to save $300,000 a year by doing something that a lot of the organizations you're involved with did a long time ago. They said to people uh, in uh, many of the parts of their, of their field staff, you will get a TTC paid landline or a TTC paid mobile phone, but not both. And I think nowadays, you know from even the habits of your own kids, certainly the same as mine, a lot of them choose not to have two phones, they have one, and it's usually the mobile phone. But this kind of modernization allows us to avoid cuts in expenditures and investments on, on things that help and support families and kids and allow us to do more to help those families and kids because we look for these efficiencies as part of an exercise that says you must do this as part of the budgeting process. The budget does not cut funding to the arts and culture. It does not cut security for Toronto community housing. It does not cut library hours. It leaves every shelter the city currently funds open and funds several new ones which have been opened in recent weeks. And I know that because I have visited them to see how we're doing and looking after those people um, who are uh, homeless, sometimes on a temporary basis and sometimes for longer. The budget leaves all of the city's library branches open, many of them now with expanded hours and program offerings because we have found, especially in some of the neighborhoods that need extra support, the library can become a very important community hub where it's more than about reading materials and research, it's about language programs and programs to help kids and families, including a lot of newcomers uh, to our city. So I believe our budget for this year is sound, it is responsible, and it is caring. It reflects the complex needs of our city that I referred to earlier and the budget realities of an organization with limited sources of revenue. I'm proud of the budget. I'm proud of the work that, that Gary Crawford and the members of the Budget Committee have done and the, the work that went into it by our public service as well. Because I am committed to listening to all the people of Toronto and finding a way forward that is in the best interests of our city and that maintains and expands the vital services that we provide, that is one of the other reasons why I'm proud of this budget. Simply, believe, simply put, I have to believe that we have come close to achieving the balanced outcome that we sought and I think that most of the people of Toronto would want us to achieve when, on the one hand, I have a small group of council critics who say we're not spending enough and who call on us for huge property tax hikes to make up for that, while on the same day, another group of city council critics say that we're spending too much and call for massive cuts to transit and childcare. I have to believe when those two groups on the same day both speak and say on the one hand, you're not spending enough, spend more and increase taxes a lot more, and on the other hand, there are groups that say taxes are too high, you're spending too much, cut child care and cut transit, that we've probably arrived at just about the right place if you really look at the best interests of the people of Toronto. And I could name names of people who did that in the last couple of days if you wish, but I won't. C'est une budget qui reflète l'équilibre que les gens attendent. Les impôts restent faibles, les économies réalisées et les investissements judicieux dans les priorités comme le transport en commune, le logement et la garde d'enfants. 
So I think we have listened carefully. But as I listen and do my part to represent all of the people of Toronto, I would hope to be listened to as well as the head of the City Council, the elected mayor representing from across the city representing all of these people. The Toronto region is home to 20% of all Canadians. The region generates more than 18% of the total national GDP and our population growth is three times larger than the City of Calgary. And yet, we make up just 1.3% of general government expenditures in Canada. As Maclean's magazine recently put it, and I quote, Toronto's future is underfunded, and that needs to change. I am disheartened, in fact, by the fact that David Crombie stood here in 1974 and talked about the same thing, this kind of paternalistic relationship that exists especially between the provincial governments across the country and the big, sophisticated, accountable cities. The City of Toronto and its government are bigger than many provinces in this country. And yet I spend a huge amount of my time scrambling up the street to ask for permission to do this or that that is clearly in the best interest of the city and where I'm prepared with my colleagues to be held accountable for those decisions in elections that we face uh, that are every bit as rigorous as elections that are faced at that level of government. Last year... Last year, the City of Toronto tried to take some responsibility for correcting this balance. We tried to take some responsibility ourselves for that. We put forward our own plan to raise revenue and invest in our city's needs, a plan to build, and an honest plan to pay for that building. An honest plan to pay for that building, because I was prepared to stand up and my colleagues stood with me to say, let's be honest with people. If we want to build transit, if we want to fix housing, if we want to provide for the needs of our citizens, it's not free and we're going to have to pay for it and make sure we then responsibly steward uh, those resources. At the City Council, 33 councillors representing diverse neighbourhoods from across Toronto and from all ends of the political spectrum voted in favour of road tolls and of a hotel tax and the end to our city's outdated vacant property rebate a very rare 80% consensus of the city councillors voting that day, and it's especially rare when it comes to revenue measures. Once, about a couple of years ago, before my time as mayor, they spent a whole day debating various revenue measures that could be undertaken to address precisely what I'm talking about and had the raw courage to vote down all 11 and opt for none. This plan would have helped us to address not only our ongoing operating pressures while also giving us a source of revenue to leverage for investment in large-scale capital projects such as a transit and housing. But as you know, our request to introduce tolls under the City of Toronto Act was denied by the province of Ontario. Our hands have been tied, but our needs have not been met. And so we expect more. A city that generates so much economic prosperity for our country and for our province, especially when it is denied the opportunity to address its own finances, cannot continue to receive so little investment in return. Toronto is home to nearly three million people. We are the corporate and innovation headquarters of our country. We have millions of transit riders every day. I've said before, when people say, well, you're asking for special treatment for Toronto, I'll say, no, I'm prepared to be the sa treated the same as any other city in Canada that has millions of transit riders every single day. And I'll be treated the same as any other city in Canada that has 58,000 units in its housing corporation, the second largest landlord of its kind in North America. Our residents are creating jobs and industries, they're curing diseases, they're excelling in the arts, they're helping solve problems to the benefit of our country and our province as a whole. Our city is among the most admired and livable in Canada because people have made those investments over time and taken those decisions. And we are Canada's champion. We are Canada's champion. We continue to attract from around the world, as you know, whether it's in healthcare or technology or education or anywhere else, the best and the brightest from around the world. This is a place that is a magnet for talent and for job creators and risk takers to come here and create wealth in our country for the benefit of the whole world, but certainly for the benefit of Ontario and of Canada. In this year's federal budget, 
I believe the Prime Minister and, and his team will announce funding for the second phase of its national infrastructure program and that that funding and the way it's done will demonstrate an understanding that Canada cannot succeed without the success of its cities in which 80% of Canadians live. The Prime Minister knows that investing in cities like Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and Edmonton and Calgary will benefit our entire nation and people who live in every corner of this country. But even federal government money and understanding are not enough on their own. When the second phase of these investments are announced by the federal government, I believe very strongly that the provincial governments must be held to account, all of them, including Ontario. Provinces must be held to a matching ratio for infrastructure projects so that every level of government is invested in the success of those projects, including in the cities. I expect the Government of Ontario to cost share Phase 2 of the Federal Government's transit infrastructure funding, including projects in our case like the Eglinton LRT, the Eglinton East LRT, the Waterfront Transit and the Relief Line. I also expect the province to cost share long overdue investments in social housing, including the staggering repair backlog of Toronto Community Housing, which houses some of our most vulnerable residents. And so far, that repair bill has been addressed largely by the City of Toronto taxpayers alone. And so you know the scale of our investment out of city funds this year the number will be a quarter of a billion dollars in those repairs borne alone, virtually alone, by city taxpayers. I would also expect the province would contribute land for affordable housing so that we can create more options for young people so in turn they can continue to build their lives and their careers here in the City of Toronto. And the province must also commit to helping us pay for two of the region's key transportation corridors, the Don Valley Parkway and the Gardner Expressway, which currently are 100% funded by City of Toronto residents. These roads were downloaded to the city many years ago. If it was important to protect 905 residents by denying tolls, then I believe it is important for the province to help fund those roads which are used by so many 905 residents. That was part of the thinking behind the road tolls. It is a user fee, which I think in many, many cases is a fair way to help finance things. But in this case, there were also many of the people using those roads, which were paid for by City of Toronto taxpayers, and to which those people from 905, with the greatest of respect, did not make any financial contribution. These, as we all know, are regional roads, not city roads. And they should be treated accordingly by other governments in this region and in this province. I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, very simply put, it is time for political fears, because let's not make any mistake about it. What stops people from acknowledging the importance of the City of Toronto to the economy of this province, the importance of investing in the City of Toronto for the benefit of the province of Ontario, the fact that Toronto's problems are deeper and more complex because of the size and scale of the city, what stops that is a political fear of looking like you're doing too much, quote unquote, for Toronto. And I think it is time for those fears to be set aside, especially by the province of Ontario, and replaced by bold, honest acknowledgement of the special role and the huge economic importance of Toronto to the province of Ontario and to all of Canada. I know... I know that such an acknowledgement and the money which must accompany it aren't popular outside of the city. But Ontario's golden goose must be nurtured, not ignored, if Ontario as a whole is to prosper. And I think that you could get up easily with a little bit of courage and a little bit of forthright and forthrightness and talk about the fact that these investments in Toronto will pay big dividends to all of Ontario and, and finance activities as Toronto presently does for lots of people in other parts of this province and other parts of this country. And so as we conclude Toronto's 2017 budget, I look forward to seeing federal and provincial budgets that reflect and address Toronto's distinct contributions, its unique circumstances, and its priorities. Toronto represents a huge opportunity for Ontario and for Canada right now 
right now. We're at a moment in time where the world is watching the way we live here together, which is different. We are telling a different story about how things can be done in terms of how we live together and celebrate each other's differences and take this amazing mosaic of people from around the world and instead of finding out or determining what divides us, we determine how those differences can benefit us, how we can learn from each other, how we can take the sum of the parts and, and make it more than just what uh, simple addition uh, would make it. Uncertainty and anxiety in many corners of the world make locating in Toronto a true global metropolis a real option for many talented risk takers and thinkers and job creators. Let's not blow it by letting small ball politics get in the way of big global thinking for Toronto. Let's not leave ourselves open to the divisions and the polarizations we see elsewhere because people conclude that the biggest and more remote of governments don't really understand their needs in their communities, including big communities like the City of Toronto, needs like transit and needs like housing and needs like childcare. Toronto is a city that has rejected and will continue to reject this approach that, that creates the seeds, it lays the seeds for division. I am a mayor who has rejected this approach that relies on or tries to in any way nurture or foment division. I do not believe this city benefits from rhetoric that pits people against each other or which undermines Toronto's potential for greatness. I believe that we must concentrate instead on city building and on moving forward together as one Toronto, where we forget about the old debates of the past that happened not very long ago, like how about two and a half years ago, where you were pitting Scarborough against downtown or North York against Etobicoke. There is no place for that. That is not going to move us forward. I will continue to try to lead a city with my colleagues where people care about each other, where our differences are celebrated as a source of strength, and where our money is invested wisely for the greatest public good. And I look forward with my fellow councillors and with all levels of government to achieve what is best for Toronto, because I honestly believe in my heart, and I know you can discount for the fact there's a bias because I'm a lifelong Torontonian and its mayor, but I honestly believe that as Toronto thrives and grows, and sets an example for the world, that is good for Ontario and that is good for Canada. And I am all about building up Ontario and building up Canada through doing what I can together with all of you to build up Toronto. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's now my privilege to invite our first Vice President, Colin Lynch, to deliver the thank you to Mayor Tory. It's a pleasure to deliver uh, these remarks of thanks, particularly as I've had the pleasure of knowing the Mayor for several uh, months in several settings, including uh, Toronto Community Housing. He's an inspiring example uh, for us all. I can think of few harder working individuals, few harder working individuals who care, and few harder working caring individuals with principles in public life than John Tory. We've had the benefit of listening to a principled and balanced approach on, fun on finding savings and funding priorities. We've listened to a man with a deep passion for a city and for its future. And so I'd like to thank the mayor on behalf of our club, not simply for delivering a great speech, but for being a principled leader and a visionary for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our sponsor for today's lunch. We're a not-for-profit club and we couldn't do what we do and host such great speeches without our support. So, uh, Scotiabank, let's give them a round of applause for supporting today's lunch. Uh, I would also like to thank our uh, print sponsor, the National Post, and our media broadcast sponsor, Rogers TV, for supporting this event. And although our club has been around since 1903, we have moved into the 21st century and are active on social media. So on your program, you could see we're active on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and now recently Snapchat, which I don't even know how to use, but we're on Snapchat. So check it out. And I would love for you to join us at some upcoming events. 
We have on February the 21st the Attorney General, Minister Yasser Nakfi, at the Arcadian Court. And we have the Minister of Health, Dr. Eric Hoskins, on March the 2nd at the Intercontinental Hotel. And finally, on March the 7th, a very interesting conversation between Christopher Wine, President of Great Gulf, in conversation with Jennifer Keysmat, Toronto's Chief City Planner, on the future of communities. And thank you once again for joining today uh, on Valentine's Day of all days. We should have set up a little speed dating event, but missed opportunity, <laughs> perhaps, for next time. So this meeting is now officially adjourned. Enjoy your afternoon, and thank you once again for coming to the Empire Public Council.